To a lot of gamers, the Nintendo 64 had a certain magic quality to it that made it timeless. Perhaps it was just a nostalgia kicking in, but the memories that these games gave us will be instilled in us forever. For those who didn't have the opportunity to try out the system back in the day, or if you were born after that time, this may sound a tad odd. You had this certain group of gamers who constantly rave about this system that seems no different than any other by today's standard. And really, I don't have an explanation as to why this is. Perhaps it just hit us at a certain time in our life that made us gush over it. But even going back to it today, it still warms my heart. For those who've watched my first video about Nintendo 64 Mysteries that I put out more than a year ago, this is the second installment of that. Beyond this video, there are still some more mysteries I want to cover, yet I don't really know how to get footage for some of them or how to do them justice. I know that sounds super vague and mysterious, but I want to make sure I can cover them right as they require certain parameters to be met. However, this video features six more of these mysteries that I hope you'll enjoy. Some of you may be familiar with a few of these, but perhaps there'll be some new ones as well. Without further ado, here are six more Nintendo 64 mysteries I spent hours trying to solve. Banjo-Kazooie is no newbie to the world of mysteries. As I covered before, the Ice Key taught me relentlessly throughout my entire playthrough of the game. However, like most of the games I played as a kid, they often contain more than just one mystery. And this one in particular was super annoying to me because it hinted at something beyond the mystery itself. Near the end of the game before finding Gruntilda, you have a chance to enter the lab where Tootie's beauty was stolen from her. Within this lab, you find two machines. Of course, these two machines are interesting themselves because you can see inside them, but what was more interesting than these machines were the two doors within this room. As we all know, doors that can't be opened are the bane of any child's existence. Nothing irks me more than this, but at the same time, I can't give up the fight. However, there was something about the left door that was very interesting, and that was that it actually led to a hallway behind it. So not only were we talked with a door that wouldn't open, but the game designers actually decided to put a hallway behind it that you could view if you moved your camera around. The other door in this room doesn't appear to have a hallway behind it though, so it made me feel like there was something special about the door to the left. Of course, since there were cheats and plan mechanics for stop and swap, this didn't make things any easier as time went on. I think I briefly recall reading something online about what this door may have been planned for, but truthfully, I can't recall what it was. There is however an area called Gruntilda's Lair Tower Room, apparently in the game files. But there is nothing but text that identifies this area as it doesn't physically exist outside of being a name. <sighs> Doors that don't open will continue to haunt me forever. When most people think of secrets in GoldenEye 007 for Nintendo 64, they typically default to the island across the dam at the first stage. However, to me, this was only one of several mysteries this game had to offer. While I spent most of my time in multiplayer blowing up bathrooms as seen in my Pixel Portal video, I did spend a great deal of time wandering around the levels on single player too. Interesting enough, the areas I thought would hold the most mysteries often held none, yet the cramped interior levels were a bit different. In particular, the level silo had something that baffled me for the longest time. And that was Armoff's briefcase. For those of you who never got this briefcase or whom don't remember, if you shoot Armoff near the end of the level, he drops two items after enough shots. And each item is a collectible. They are a keycard and a briefcase. However, the problem with this briefcase is that it doesn't actually do anything in the game. As a kid who stumbled upon it one day, it drove me crazy trying to figure out what it actually did. During this time, no one had mentioned it online as people weren't diving into the game's mysteries at this point yet. So you essentially wandered around with this briefcase in your inventory, trying to figure out if it had some use in the level, like a secret objective of some sort. Surprisingly, it is possible to kill Armov at the end of Silo as well without cheating, if you simply shoot him before he gains awareness of your presence. I always found this odd since he is in multiple levels past this point in the game, and I have no idea how he came back to life. Many people speculate that this briefcase used to be part of an additional objective that was removed from the game, and despite removing it, the developer simply left this item in. This briefcase was more dire than normal mysteries since you actually acquired a tangible part of it. It was an ice key of a tease to say the least, and it will be something I will always remember. Donkey Kong 64 had quite a lot of quirky things in it. I believe I spent the most time retracing my steps in this game out of any other game I played simply due to having to backtrack for bananas. By the time I collected everything, I had also explored every corner of this level as well. 
Having to pop back into past worlds happened very often, and during all of this, there was a few odd things that ran to along the way. One of the most notorious of these things was this random wall within Angry Aztec. This wall looked like it could be opened up or destroyed by some means, but nothing ever opened it. It was peculiar because there weren't any other walls in this level like it, and as you came around the bend it was right there taunting you in the hallway. I always wondered what it contained, and because of the nature of Donkey Kong 64, it made me think that maybe I had to hit a switch somewhere in the game to break it down. Of course, this never came to be, and this wall continues to bother me to this day. Sometime after my quest ended for the Sky Temple and the Temple of Light, there was another hot topic that swept through the fields of Hyrule, and that was the mysterious Unicorn Fountain. The Unicorn Fountain was something that was hinted at in early screenshots of the game, and people theorized it might actually be where you obtain the Triforce. Now, where this fountain resided was in a few different places. Some people claimed it was in the Temple of Light, but most people insisted it was beneath the ice in Zora's domain. Truthfully, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense, as one would believe that the room should be flooded. But, at the same time, there are room entrances in Banjo-Kazooie that went from above ground to underwater, so maybe it could be like that in Zelda too. But, most of us never knew there was a way to get beneath the ice by glitching out of boundaries, so we spent all of our time trying to figure out ways to melt all the ice. Obviously, this amounted to nothing besides a ton of wasted green potions, but we pressed on regardless. The truth was, the room we were all aiming to get into was actually a dead end and it didn't lead to anywhere like we thought it would. Many people speculate that there may have been plans for a small treasure chest here at some point, but as it stands, it was nothing more than a crevice. Years later, someone actually recreated the Unicorn Found to scale for a planned mod release, but the finished mod never came about. However, it is possible to find it online alongside pictures of the fountain, and the child of me was extremely satisfied when I saw it. In some ways, it brought this long-awaited adventure to a close. While Conqueror's Bad Fur Day isn't a game that should be taken too seriously, that still didn't mean the things beyond the story weren't appealing. Conqueror's Bad Fur Day was a game that we didn't get to try until much later on, and because of that, it didn't have quite the same appeal that Bandit Kazooie or Donkey Kong 64 had. But there was one place in particular that I fixed my attention on, and that was the windmill in the hub world. Now, what bothered me about this windmill was the various ways it looked like you could enter. There was the door, and there were two areas above it that you couldn't reach that appeared to be exits from the inside. Being someone who had a weird affinity for doors you couldn't enter, this windmill was a prime hotspot because it taunted me with three. Or at least three I could see. I didn't know if there was a way to get in the top either, so I just sat back and thought of ways to get in. Later on in the game, when the windmill got destroyed and Conker made a joke about it being in the final level, this sense to get inside before its demise only grew stronger. Of course, I never did find a way to get inside though, which was kind of a letdown. Coming back later on with cheats, I found out that none of these entrances actually let you go inside, which kinda sucks. It reminded me of Glover's Castle all over again. While platformers were the games that often had the most mysteries, there were plenty of others scattered across different types of titles as well. Mario Kart 64 was a game that we sunk tons of time into. From playing hours on end across the game's various tracks, to hunting each other down time and time again in battle mode. My love of Mario Kart and pushing this game's boundaries actually stemmed from the Super Nintendo version, as I often used the feather to try to get into areas past the walls. Some of these places had grace areas that you could stay in without being picked up and taken away, and we played around with these for hours. This sense of adventure rekindled itself in the Nintendo 64 version, but of all the places that I found odd in the game, I was fixed on Peach's Castle in the Royal Raceway. This area was separate from the actual track, and by wandering back there you were almost guaranteed to lose the race if you took the detour. What both intrigued and bothered me about this area was how it mirrored Mario 64 exactly. In some ways, it gave us a perspective of what was just beyond the hills of Mario 64. However, what I was most interested in was getting inside the castle though. As a kid, I thought there had to be some reason for this area besides it being a throwback to Mario 64, and I can't tell you how many times I charged this door trying to get inside. I remember one time I actually glitched through the castle accidentally to only find myself landing in water. While this was disappointing, it was also oddly satisfying because I got inside, even if I met a watery grave. Regardless of not being able to get in, both my friends and brothers often met up in this area to mess around. And because of that, I will always remember it fondly. While all these mysteries never amount to anything substantial, they sort of create a sense of history about these places. 
Even though we always left with our hands empty, or with a suitcase in GoldenEye's situation, it was this unwavering sense of trying to figure out the unknown that I will always cherish. These mysteries brought both my brothers and friends together as we discussed their possibilities, and the child of me will always ponder about what they could have held. But I've been talking about this from my perspective for a while now, and of course, I'd love to hear what gaming mysteries you often try pursuing. Were there any levels you constantly explored as a kid trying to uncover the unknown? Were there any rumors that were local to your area that you haven't heard anyone else talk about? Please share your thoughts in the comments below, as I would totally love to hear your story. And with that, thanks for tuning in to this mysterious trip to the 90s. If you'd like to join me in my YouTube voyage and celebrate the gaming worlds of the past, then the subscribe button is just what you're looking for. Thanks for watching, guys and gals, and until my next video, cheers. You made it to the end of the video, but wait, your quest isn't over yet. If you haven't watched my first Nintendo 64 Mysteries video, I highly recommend you do so. It explains a bit more in depth about how these rumors and mysteries came about. On the flip side, you can also check out my video on mishearings in video games, as they are quite funny. As always, there's a slew of other videos on my channel too, so regardless, I hope you enjoy.